Hi, everybody, and welcome to the HIV Quarterly Brief. This is the quarter, quarter four 2021 uh, conversation. And uh, joining me today, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Laura Waters, all the way from London, England. Welcome, Laura. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here again. So uh, we are not going to be discussing the Greek alphabet or any of its letters. Is that okay with you? That is just fine by me. I've had more conversations about COVID in the last four or five days than I've had in the last two years. So yes, we can park that one. Well, we might talk about COVID as it relates to HIV. In fact, I thought I would start us off by actually mentioning a fairly large study. We've seen many of these studies so far on COVID in people with HIV. And this is the National COVID Cohort Collaboration, a, a huge population-based study on taking a look at how people do with uh, who are, have HIV with, with COVID. It was published in, in the Lancet. Uh, and essentially what it said was something that has been seen before, that if you look at this 13,000 or so individuals with HIV and compare them to uh, a million or plus without HIV, if you look overall, they, they, they did do worse, but a lot of it was doing worse because they had comorbidities or they had other factors that led to worse outcome. And really the primary driver, uh, HIV related driver of adverse outcomes is a low CD4 cell count. We've had many of these studies so far. I mean, I'm kind of curious, uh, Dr. Waters, uh, would, how do you counsel your patients with HIV about what the risk to, to them is for COVID? Yeah, and, and, and I think that's a brilliant question to ask because that's always the most important thing with any study that you're reading or listening to is what is the implication for someone living with that condition? So thank you for that question. So I tend to say that, that the outcomes overall for people with HIV in large controlled studies do appear to be worse. However, that appears to be driven primarily by other factors. And you've mentioned comorbidities. I think the CD4 signal is an important one because intuitively it feels like it should be a driver of worse outcomes. But I think some of the early cohorts didn't show that. But more recently, I think some of the early cohorts perhaps didn't have very complete data about some of the HIV markers, viral load, people being on R or not, and of course CD4. So I, I think it makes sense, of course, that people with a lower CD4 don't do so well. Yeah. So I discussed the data honestly, and certainly in the UK, people with HIV are already prioritised. They were prioritised for vaccination before the same age general population. For people with low CD4 count, they've been prioritised for a full COVID vaccine so they have three vaccines as part of the initial vaccine course mm -hmm. and certainly what I'm doing at the moment which is phoning people to, to talk to them about outpatient treatment with antivirals mm. or neutralizing monoclonal antibodies having HIV is one of the risk factors to consider when we're kind of triaging people for that treatment mm. so I think we appropriately triage people with HIV to get vaccines and some of the treatments. So, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, vaccines, uh, Dr. Waters, because uh, there's starting to be some emerging data on the response to vaccination in people with HIV. You want to summarize some of that information? There's a paper by Spinelli and colleagues, uh, which is an American cohort. They've taken people with HIV and 100 HIV negative age match controls and looked at responses to mRNA vaccines. The details of immunology are beyond me anyhow, but the headline is that there are always some people who respond less well, and that was more common amongst people with HIV. I think the difficulty is it's a cross-sectional study, and I think what we, we still don't fully understand, we know that developing uh, responses to vaccines correlates with clinical efficacy. But I don't think we fully understand the precise level of, of immune response that's critical and the durability of response. So for me, this kind of data is interesting. People with HIV, I think expectedly may respond less well to vaccines. And we know that for many other vaccines we've been using for years. But again, I think people with well-controlled HIV can expect a similar response to vaccines as the general population. And of course, it's all the other factors to protect people against COVID acquisition that we need to be mindful of. So, so let's move on uh, and, and not discuss COVID again. <laughs> and here's a refreshingly, we can talk about um, the, the, the new uh, EACS guidelines and ways in which they differ from DHHS. I want to just say that 
just as a reminder, the DHHS guidelines have uh, only uh, unboosted um, high resistance barrier integrase inhibitors in their uh, first line treatment. And that's obviously dolutegravir and bictegravir. What, what, do you, what do you have in Europe as your options for first line therapy? Well, th there was of course that sort of 12 month period when, when EACS and DHHS were precisely aligned and it was really the kind of integrase only era. But EACS, which historically had been very broad, you know, we used to joke that which regimens weren't recommended by, by EACS first line, but actually they have expanded slightly. And I think accurately or accurately and correctly to include one of my favorite drug classes, NNRTI. So essentially what EACS have done is DHHS plus TDF, lamivudine and doravirine first line. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that's sensible. I don't think integrases suit everybody. And I think it's really important to have a choice. Now, of course, the criticism for poor old doravirine is it's never been compared head to head. <laughs> And that is a downside for it, but I think it's a well-tolerated drug. Um, I think there are some advantages, certainly in terms of drug-drug interactions. Even Bictegravir can be hobbled by interactions with cations. There was a case report recently, admittedly someone taking very high dose and very high dose garlic as well. But, but you know, I'm, I'm scraping the barrel a little here, obviously, <laughs> but I do think NNRTIs play a role still. And I think having an NL, NNRTI up there as a choice first line yeah. is a good thing. Speaking of guidelines, I I will remind everybody that we've recently had an update in the PrEP guidelines. And uh, you want to mention some of the features in that uh, particular document? I know it's a CDC GOT document, and so it doesn't really apply across the water. But, um, you know, I think that there's, oh, it's always nice to hear what CDC has to say about something besides COVID. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, we, we maybe go to our own national guidance and then the European guidance first, but we always cross reference against the, the US guidance, and actually particularly around um, prevention. So from my knowledge, the new things are one around monitoring, because I think diagnosing new HIV acquisition on PrEP is, is very tricky. So very. the routine recommendation of HIV RNA, then there is the uh, intermittent PrEP. So that's something that we've long embraced uh, in, in the UK and, and Europe. Um, and I think it's made its first appearance into the uh, CDC guidance, although mm. it's important to point out that the evidence for that is only around TDF FTC, not TAF FTC. And then finally, of course, as we enter this era of long acting antiretrovirals, uh, injectable cabotegravir, I understand, is approved and has made a feature in the guidance. Yeah, yeah, no, it actually has been approved since our last quarterly brief. Um, it's... Uh, I have to confess it happened so recently that we have no one on it. Although uh, I was just talking with one of our uh, nurses the other day, and she said that there's someone who has been begging her for a non pill option for prep. And obviously he'll be one of the first people we have on this. Um, one of the things that, that we're going to probably talk about when we talk about injectable cabotegravir or is that, you know, there are uh, logistical issues to this and uh, financial issues to this choice that are going to be, uh, challenging. And I, I wonder if you can anticipate what's going to happen when you um, when you have it available in Britain. Oh, goodness. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, we, we've we only just had the, the, the injectables for treatment um, almost approved. The kind of final recommendation comes out in, in January. Uh -huh. uh, and then the NHS has three months to prepare to deliver those recommendations. For prevention, I mean, obviously, we're going to be several months behind the US in terms of getting that approved. Just getting back to the monitoring, uh, I, I want to actually... Uh... Uh, clue people in to uh, figure 4B in the guidelines. And it really goes through um, what we're now going to be doing when we're monitoring people on PrEP, which we're going to send both of uh, HIV viral load and the antigen antibody assay. And it's obviously going to be easy to interpret if both are negative or both are positive. But when you have discordance, uh, wow, all bets are off. And, and it does have a little flow, sheet, flow diagram. Uh, I would just say uh, consult an expert. And since that uh, expert is uh, with me right now, um, <laughs> what are you doing now when you have a patient who you think might have acquired HIV on PrEP and you have equivocal results? What, what is your actual practice? Oh, and another good question. First, first, of course, careful history taking. Um, but generally speaking, we do the uh, RNA, which is not a routine test for us. So we still use uh, fourth generation um, serology. 
We'll do an RNA, we'll do a DNA, and we'll keep on checking and checking over time. And if there's a possibility they have acquired HIV, we tend to intensify. So we'll mm -hmm. whack in a third drug, and that's usually raltegravir oh. um, if the RNA is negative, and then we'll continue to monitor. Um, but but more often than not, we, we tend to just keep watching and repeating. And, and sometimes we find we just have this slightly odd serology that's stable, uh, a, a bit mm -hmm. like a fast syphilis result yeah. in, in when we yeah. see people with HIV. So all right, switching now to treatment, uh, I'm going to just start off with this, uh, the whole the whole theme of starting treatment right away. And uh, I don't know whether the same is true uh, in, in your part of the world, but here in the United States, far and away, the most commonly started initial regimen on same day ART is Bictegravir FTC TAF. And so there was a study from Europe and it was presented at EX where they looked at 117 people in 15 sites in France and just basically put them all on big tegravir after see TAF. And then they showed the uh, primary outcome at week uh, 24, which is actually not enough time, but that's the nature of abstracts uh, is that is that 80% were already less than 50. Uh, another um, group was probably heading there. Uh, and then there were people who were lost to follow up. And then the per protocol analysis, this is very similar to what was seen in the Dolotegravir lamivudine study. Per protocol at week 24, it was it was 87.4 percent. I feel like um, it it was worth highlighting just because it's become the most common regimen we start right away. And I don't know we even know whether you are doing this or whether this regimen is one of the ones that uh, that Nash, the NHS approves, etc. So, comments, thoughts? Yeah. So it, it's. I mean. I'm I'm an out I'm, a, I'm an outlier. I still remain skeptical about the actual proven benefits of same day art. Um, I will always honour patient choice, and if yeah. somebody wants to start on the same day, fine. Uh, so when my colleagues say to me, "Well, patients prefer it," I always push back and say, "Yes, but what, what was the evidence base? What 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 did you tell them about the potential advantages?" And I do think it's important that the benefits of same day art have only really been shown in, in sort of low and middle income yeah. countries, places where loss to follow up is important. And actually I'm not having a dig, that's the pattern in the U S isn't it? That that yes. sort of testing to engagement step is, is where you lose people, which yes. isn't the case in the UK. So I, I do think it's very specific to an individual, but also to a, to a region. Um, does it cause harm is the thing I want to know. And although I'm sure it doesn't, I do wonder about the long-term impact on adherence on, I've had a couple of people express regret, again, more anecdotes about starting treatment same day when with hindsight, they wish they'd actually settled into the diagnosis for a few weeks or months. Having said that, probably about half the people that we see newly diagnosed, we do start same day and Bictegravir, um, uh, tenofovir-alafenamide and emtricitabine fixed dose combination is one of the options that we use um, because it is high barrier. We're not using dual art in this setting. Mm -hmm. Of course, some would argue there is some evidence to support that. Mm -hmm. And as for this study, yeah, like all of the same day art studies, we, we've had Diamond, uh, we've had the Dolutegravir Lamivudine one, the name which has completely passed me by right now, and, and now this one. And they're all stats. these single arm. Stats. That's it. Stats. They'll never forgive me. The stat study. Never. And 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 there are all these perspective, yes, but they're still single arm studies. I think yep. what was striking for me in this one, although the numbers really are small for the very high viral loads is you know, integrators are seen as somehow infallible and that even with people with viral loads incredibly high, you expect people to suppress very quickly. And the, you know, notably lower suppression rate in that above half a million baseline group, admittedly yeah. with what I would consider quite homeopathic numbers of patients. <laughs> um, I, I think it is worth noting that even integrators need to work hard to get very high viral loads undetectable quickly. Yeah. Yes, I, uh, I uh, had the pleasure of publishing a paper with, your friend and colleague, Dr. Orkin. Oh, yes. And, and um, Muge Sevek before she yes. became a COVID celebrity. Yes. On uh, the risk factors of uh, integrase resistance in, in people who are integrase naive, dolotegravir in particular. And the paper basically found that these sky high viral loads uh, are definitely a risk factor. So something to keep an eye on. Speaking yep. of Dr. Orkin, how about that flare study? We now have 124 week results. How, how's it yes. looking? Yes. So uh, yeah, like flare and it's it's like many studies. It's a study that keeps on giving. Uh, <laughs> one to when they're when they're going to stop following people up. I mean, 
to me, not, nothing, it's a great paper, it's a fantastic paper, but nothing particularly surprising or new. I mean, people who are doing well continue to do well. Uh, there's a sort of, within the study, there's a group uh, now who weren't on injectables initially, who then go straight into um, injectables without the oral lead-in of those components. No particular harms, no particular surprises. Um, I, what can I say? It's it's an, a regimen that works for many. I think you, you, my, my bugbear about this regimen and it's one I'll be watching very carefully as we roll it out in the UK is that some people experience virologic failure despite 100% adherence. I think what's reassuring about flare is that that virologic failure it appears to be mainly in the first year mm -hmm. rather than subsequently and there might be a little trickle but generally speaking as we see with most sort of uh, most regimens over time the longer you've been suppressed the more likely you are to stay suppressed. Yeah. But um, other than that, nothing, nothing groundbreaking, I didn't yeah. think. Yeah, no, I th agree. I mean, it's really the most interesting thing about this uh, regimen is how logistically clinics are making it happen. Okay, now we're going to take a look at uh, some switch studies and... We're going to talk about some controversial Swiss studies, and I deliberately um, chose ones that that may or may not make sense. But why don't you take us through at least this first one, which is it's switching people to dolutegravir lamivudine who actually have resistance to lamivudine. <laughs> This one's from France, and it's a retrospective cohort study looking at the impact of M184V or I, of course, conferring, conferring high-level resistance to the lamivudine component of this two-drug regimen, dolutegravir lamivudine. And what they've shown is that there doesn't appear to be much of an impact of the 184. So when they do their Kaplan-Meier of um, you know, virologic failure over time, uh, the, the lines are superimposed. Uh, in fact, after year four, if anything, uh, it looks like having a 184 is slightly <laughs> beneficial, which uh, by then the numbers truly are minuscule. Um, but I think it, it's tricky. The thing to, I think that's important is that most people have been suppressed for a very long period of time. And so I think this fits in uh, with, with that more recent understanding, I think, that actually resistance isn't forever and there is ongoing evolution of the viral pool you know, when people are suppressed and actually 184 may disappear. I just think this type of data can be interesting. This type of data I think can be reassuring if dolutegolamifidine is your only possible choice for someone with a 184. Yeah. But really, you know, I think for most people you can construct something a, a bit more robust and I think it's the prospective studies that are going to be really yeah. crucial here. And, and I think the, the work that some other groups are doing is going to be more meaningful. Yeah, there is a there was a prospective study presented at uh, EAX on this, uh, this very issue. It wasn't a randomized trial. It was basically 100 people, 50 and 50, with and without 184V, who were then, uh, you know, um, basically chosen to go on dolotegravir lamivudine you know so it's not they're they're all they're all going on dolotegravir lamivudine so it's not a strategy study it's basically taking these people with different characteristics and in this uh, prospective study which is for some reason is called solar uh it is uh you know viral suppression was maintained in all of them you know yeah. I, and again i don't know why 50 persons per Per group, and uh, I will say that that like most of these studies, they are not industry funded. I don't. I think it's important to, to stress this that that this is not the way that um, the company that gave us Stolotech ever moving in as a regimen wants us to use it. So, yeah, so yeah. the people who are doing so are are kind of pushing the envelope. And I say, I I think unnecessarily. One of the phrases I, I use most commonly is is please tone down your grandiose conclusions. To conclude that dolutegravir could be prescribed safely in virologically suppressed people with a 184, if someone could look just at that statement and think, oh, well, that's what that study's shown. It, 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 I don't think it has shown that, actually. And I, I do think that authors have a responsibility yeah. to make their conclusions appropriate for the type of data and the number of people they've included. And now I'm really going to press your buttons, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is there was a modeling study presented oh, that yes. looked at uh, changes in inflammatory markers that yes. have been observed in both the Tango study and a second study called AIR. And both of yes. these studies showed that IL-6 levels 
were higher uh, in uh, at certain time points in people on two drugs rather than three drugs, and then plotted out what might happen over time if you applied those differences in IL-6 levels yeah. and the implications for clinical outcomes. Um, not surprisingly, high IL-6 levels are associated with worse outcomes. And this uh, model sort of made that point. Your, your yes. thoughts, Dr. <laughs> Waters? Well, I mean, this, this is the type of study I, I loathe. And I, I don't understand that this, I, I think very non-scientific torture of a single biomarker. I just think it's utterly inappropriate. IL-6 is just part of an incredibly complex cascade of you know, cytokines and proteins and lipids and all sorts of things. And I, I think actually it's it's we're doing our patients a disservice by drawing again grandiose conclusions from the torture of a single biomarker. Let's let's now just talk about new antiretroviral or our investigational antiretroviral agents. And, and the big news really in the last quarter comes from this latch uh, on the on the favorable side, there was a press release that the that once daily treatment of deraverine is latrovir going back to one of your favorite drugs sounds like as a switch strategy is every bit as good as uh, stable therapy or and every bit as good as uh, bictegravir FTC TAF. And so that's clearly good news. But on the other hand, uh, there has been a pause on some of the long acting studies. You want to summarize what we know so far? Yeah. So, um, well, I mean, I don't think we know a lot yet. I really, really hope that we would see more data at Croy, actually, because I think Croy as a conference would be a great forum to discuss some of the findings. But essentially, for the weekly and the monthly, is Latrovir based? studies things have stopped for now and it's all around a safety stick a safety signal uh, related to total lymphocyte count and cd4 uh, and also in, in um for prep um in people who weren't having their cd4 counts monist obviously hiv negative in the prep studies there was an appreciable decline in total mm. lymphocyte count uh, on his latrovir now initially it was mk8507 msd's investigation nnrti that was halted um, but then you're know, having released a statement saying we've got every confidence in his latrovir msd then um took the decision i think just days later mm -hmm. to halt some of the uh, his latrovir studies as well so what's going on I don't know. There's been discussions that um, that these drugs are causing some kind of pharmacodynamic intracellular uh, phenomenon, a bit bit like the tenofovir and didanosine interaction that we saw in the past. But I, I think there's an, an awful lot of, of questions. I really, really hope this isn't the end of the road for Islatrovir. And I know we haven't seen any data from the implant yet in terms of impact mm. on, on white cell yeah. counts. But I think it's it's you know, a hugely promising drug. If his latrovir goes down the drain, then that leaves old poor old Lena Kapovir without a, a date to take to the prom for <laughs> some time. So I, I, I think you know I, I think there'll be a lot of very very disappointed people. But hopefully, if if we understand the mechanism, then maybe using lower doses, maybe the daily will still be good. Of course, daily isn't what everyone was particularly excited about, is it? It was right. the longer version. Right. What's your take on it? Yeah, very good points. I mean, all I, I want to just uh, go back to the dosing issue is that the, the total daily dose when given either weekly or monthly comes out as higher than the daily dose when it's used with deraverine. And perhaps the dose adjustment will um, ameliorate this problem, but we'll, we'll have to see. Okay, well, uh, Dr. Laura Waters, it was a pleasure having you uh, on to chat about HIV medicine and only a little bit about COVID-19. I hope <laughs> I hope you will uh, join us again soon. Thank you, Dr. Paul Sachs. It's always an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye.